All right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I, I uh, am excited to see all of your smiling faces here today, I'm assuming. I can see the little squinty eyes. That's what it means to smile these days, right? <laughs> so I'm glad you're here, and I um, appreciate your patience with a whole lot of firsts this morning. It's a first for me being up here. It's a first for me being an adult class for a number of years, actually, other than a couple of times when I was able to sneak away and trade with Isaac to, to hit, um, listen to Roger's classes a couple of times. And it's a first for all of us <laughs> yes. to be together. So my appreciation and thanks to these two dear ladies who are willing to help out here this morning. And um, I am so excited when I look at the, the topic of the lesson this week, even though I've always, for many years, have been in children's classes and have not been keeping up with the adult um, quarterly, when I delved into it this week, I thought, wow, what a blessing for me to be able to hit it on this amazing week, um, talking about God's everlasting love, just a topic we could never exhaust, and one that has been since, since before the world was ever created, and only will get better at the end of this earth when the beginning of um, eternity together with God happens. So, um, that being said, let's open with a word of prayer before we get into God's word. And Rosemary, would you be willing to open us with okay. prayer? Okay. Father in heaven, we thank you for each one of us being able to be here at Linwood. And we want to pray for those that are watching online. Thank you for keeping us safe through the week and bringing us here to study. And pray that as we open your word, you will be with us in a special way. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're looking this week at kind of an overview of different covenants that we've had throughout history. And I, it looks like maybe last week you touched on this as well and will be for the next several weeks. So today we want to just talk about kind of an overview of what covenants are all about. Covenants have been in existence since the beginning of time. Why are they there? What is their purpose? Are covenants good for us? Um, do they bring a lot of restrictions? And... So let's talk about first, what is a covenant? What do we think? What, do you, what comes to your mind when you think about what's a covenant? It's a kind of a deal between usually two people, mm -hmm. countries even. Yep. Okay. So some kind of a contract, mm -hmm. something that carries some weight behind it, a binding contract. I think Maybe. of marriage as well. Marriage. Mm -hmm. Marriage is a covenant. You know, the old, old vows were to death until death we... Yeah. Yep. Um, Set some legal restrictions yes, upon uh -huh. both parties. Mm -hmm. uh, another word that comes to my mind when I think of a covenant is a promise. Not only with the covenants that God has made with us, but many times in the covenants that are made between countries or between people, it's oftentimes, if not always, with the purpose of, look, if you do this, I'll do this. So let's make an alliance together because it'll be better for all of us. Usually people don't enter into covenants that are going to be to their demise on all parties. <laughs> no one would be game for that. So I think promise is something that's involved. Um, covenants can come with conditions as well. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, I'm not going to hold up my end either. That, so that mm -hmm. kind of relates to being a relationship. Mm -hmm. Definitely. If you trust me, I'll trust you. Yes. sometimes to make it more binding, we write it down on a piece of paper. Correct. Or even go to a lawyer's office. Yep. Have witnesses. It, yep. Yes. You know, so there's different ways of having a covenant. Exactly. And I think the reason that we go to writing it down, having a lawyer create a legal document, things like that, is because it's a protection factor. It protects the outcome. It's, that's why when we get married, we don't just say, hey, let's, shall we just pretend to be married and let's just say we're married. We actually have to go through some legal things because it protects the future of that relationship. It protects the children. It protects the property. It protects other things that are involved in that. Um, I was looking up some words or some other meanings of covenants, and I came across a few different definitions that I think are interesting to look at. We've talked about the alliance, like you can make between countries, uh, constitution, that's another, we have a constitution of the United States, and other places have that too, that's a type of a covenant, and it can be a lot of times throughout history, monarchs to their subjects, they can come up with things, so this is what the rules are going to be, you better abide by these. Um, the Bible actually talks about covenants that people can make as individuals, 
between themselves and God. Like, you think about Job. Did he make a covenant? The Bible tells us he made a covenant with what? Does anybody remember? His eyes. He made a covenant with his eyes. Now, that covenant, by him making that himself, was a benefit to his wife, and it was a protection to their marriage, and it was a covenant he made that he, um, you know, had between himself and God. So sometimes it may be something we come up with on our own, just in the quiet of our own minds. Another definition of a covenant can be that of a friendship. So again, we're going back to relationship type thing. Can we think of anybody in the Bible who made a covenant with their friendship? What about young? Jonathan and David? David and Jonathan, mm -hmm. very, very good. And that covenant was not only to protect their friendship, but what did they do for the future? Look after one another's families. That's right. They agreed and they made a covenant mm -hmm. with each other that they would protect their families, and David followed through with that. And then there's the covenant in marriage, as we've talked about. Um, what other covenants, man to man, can we think of in the Bible that happened? Do we think of any other examples? There was a. Uh, well, there's Adam and Eve to start with. Yeah. That God would send his son, provide a way of. Mm hmm escape back to garden like yes god made a covenant with man right from the very get-go which is such a blessing <laughs> um i was thinking of jacob and laban they uh -huh. made a covenant uh -huh. with each other somebody didn't hold up their end of the deal <laughs> on that um, unfortunately i think a lot of times we see the covenants made between humans even if they are done legally and they're binding and all the rest of it uh, we're not we are not always very faithful with those um, maybe that was a learning experience for Jacob because he had um, sort of broken a, a bond between mm -hmm. his dad and older brother. Yep, absolutely. Through deceit. You know. Yes, I very much agree. Uh, another one that I thought of, a covenant made between humans, was that of Joshua and the Gibeonites. Um, oh. That was one that kind of came about also through deceit. <laughs> And Joshua did not seek the Lord on that one, and he made a covenant and found out, oops. But did he have to, to stick with his promise anyway? He did. And so I think that helps us realize we should be careful when we make agreements and alliances with other people, um, that we need to be prayerful in that. But let's talk a little bit about uh, the word covenant. In Hebrew is berith. I do not speak Hebrew, so... If I'm sure that's not how it's pronounced, but it's found many, many times in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, 287 times to be exact. So in other words, we can tell by that that covenants are a very important part of God's plan for his people between himself and his people and also how um, people operate here on earth. So let's talk about some examples that, of covenants that God made with his people. And Terry, you talked about one right off the bat, the very first thing we have in the Bible right out the door is a covenant that God made with his people um, to be able to put enmity between them and Satan because they had entered into sin and now they've opened themselves up to an alliance with the prince of this world, which was not what God's plan was. So God had to say, look, I have a plan already here. I'm going to enter into a covenant with you and I am going to send, here's the promise, that if you will follow me, then there will be a redemption process, which is such a blessing. Otherwise, none of us would be here today. It did take a long time. <laughs> it did. Which they look for at each generation, hoping that it would be there. Yes. And it's a long time just for Adam and Eve, almost a thousand years mm -hmm. waiting for it. it and what, what are we, 6,000 years? Which yeah. Which is a, a large part of that time, just with them. Yes, definitely. You know, um, what I keep coming back to as I was studying this lesson is that when you look at the heart of God, it is not about rule making. It isn't about, look, these are my rules. You better do them if you want to get anywhere in life. It's all about the fact that he wanted to have a relationship with his people. And he said it in as many ways as he could come up with. And he put it in as many different formats as he could. And he did so many things to prove his love for, for his people. And I, um, this is just a side note here, but a verse that is that it was very special to me this morning as I was reading Psalm 25, verse 14. It talks about that relationship that God wants on such an intimate level. It says that the secret of the Lord is for those that fear him, and then he will show them his covenant. So it's like God wants to become so intimately acquainted with his people 
that we would consider, we wouldn't tell secrets to anyone but our best friend, right? Someone we trusted with all our heart if it was something that was that vital. And I think so many times for myself and maybe for many of the rest of us, we look at God as somebody so superior, which he is, I'm not at, in all, at all trying to bring him down to our level, but we kind of view him almost as somebody who's distant, who cares about us and loves us, but as long as we do follow the rules. And I think what God's been trying to say all along is, I love you because I created you. You are my child. I just want your heart. I just want the best in life for you. And if you do this, things will go so easily for you. Not because you have to follow rules, but because that shows that you love me back. So I think there's three different parts of um, the covenant process. There's the covenant making, there's the covenant keeping, and there's covenant breaking. And maybe we're going to touch on all three of those today as we go through them. But um, let's look at the first time a covenant was talked about in using the word berith in the Old Testament, um, the Hebrew word. I don't know, um, Rosemary, would you like to, to take us into that covenant? Sure. Um, looking at Genesis 6, 18, and I'll go ahead and read that. Um, but I will establish my covenant with you, and, with, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wives, and, and your wife and your son's wives with you. So that is the first one that we find in the Bible. And it was God making that covenant with Noah. So what is Noah's response? We look at uh, verse 22. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. He built an ark. That's believing in God's promise. Mm -hmm. And that was a process of 120 years. It's a uh, long time to preach the same thing, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and, you know, there was, he was, not, I'd say he wasn't the only preacher in that, in that uh, time frame either. Because Methuselah lived during that time, if we mm -hmm. look back in history. He did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very interesting to note that the first time that the covenant word is mentioned here, which is in... Uh, verse 18 of chapter 6 of Genesis, it comes with a promise. The very first time he's using that, he's mm -hmm. saying, if you, mm -hmm. it, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. Mm -hmm. So get ready, because I'm going to do big things mm -hmm. in your life. So you are going to come into this ark that you're building, and I am going to save you from the destruction that's coming on the earth. So the very first time that he uses that covenant comes along with that promise. And he included his wife and sons and sons' wives. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a broad blessing for the time. Yeah. It was a family that was included. Relationships. That, right, again. exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And it, we talked about this a little bit before Sabbath school this morning, but, you know, we talked about how the ark was prepared for the saving of any who would come into it. And yet, if the whole world at that time had chosen to believe, would they have all fit in the ark? There had been room. <laughs> <laughs> God has a thousand ways, right? Maybe they'd <laughs> had to take the attic loft. <laughs> <laughs> there could, they could have, could have squeezed a whole lot of people on there. And as we were mentioning, too, if there was a need, he, they could have duplicated that in that amount of time. They could have, you know, possibly made more arcs. We don't have any scriptural evidence of that, but we know that God has many ways. And possibly also if people had, had chosen to actually believe the message and to repent, God is, is capable of changing his mind like he mm -hmm. did in Nineveh, like mm -hmm. with, Nineveh. with the Ninevites. So right. there are many ways, you know, we can't look at the ark and say, well, that proves that, you know, God, God's plan wasn't going to work because what if people would have believed they wouldn't have fit anyway? God had lots of ways that he could have. And again, he was calling for people to come back to him and to turn to him. Um, unfortunately... As the biblical, uh, biblical account shows us, there were not many people who were willing to return that love relationship to God. God knew this to start with, but he also left it open. Mm -hmm. If, if uh, Noah had realized that no one was going to come into the ark, it would have been really hard for him to continue 120 years, I would think, preaching the same thing and building on an ark which he had never heard of before mm -hmm. or of rain. So God knows how to help us the best, seems like. Absolutely. And did God 
follow through on his end of the bargain? <laughs> you sure did. Yep. You know, it makes me think of <clears throat> the story of Lot, too. If we fast forward a little bit, and we all know that story, when God came to destroy those cities, and Abram interceded in, on behalf of those, they weren't even able to find ten people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just it breaks my heart when you look back this far in history, right after, I mean, within the first few hundred years of the creation of the earth, when God walked and talked with people in person, in person. and their hearts had wandered so far away from him, I can't imagine the devastation that it must have caused him to realize that really, you know, when you think about destroying the earth with a flood, it was not out of just vengeance of being like, I am so sick and tired of these people. I think it was that God wanted so badly to give humans another chance. Mm -hmm. And they had gone so far that it's like, you know, if we just, let's just start over. Let's try again because the last ones, they ruined it right away. And he looked over the whole earth and he found Noah, one man in mm -hmm. Noah's family who had a heart that was in tune with him enough to be able to still commune. And so he made this whole plan of, of a way of salvation using a human being to reach other humans. How much better can you get than that? You know, yeah. his own countrymen, their own, their own family, their own relatives. Um, and yet when it came down to it, it was just that family that was the only one who was willing to actually by faith enter into the ark. And then you see very quickly again how afterward, you know, it's like, well, good, we're starting over again with just one righteous family, right? So let's just keep it that way for a while. But very quickly, their hearts were turned again, and you come to Sodom and Gomorrah, and did they find any righteous there? You know, they got down to three people who were drug out of that city. Mm -hmm. um, at least with Noah, he obeyed very willingly. He, wasn't ha he didn't have to be hauled onto the ark with, by the angels twisting his arm, thankfully. <laughs> well, it is interesting that um, it wasn't just the people that were destroyed, but the, all the animals, insects, it says everything on the land, and I think in the air, the birds, mm -hmm. it doesn't say in the sea, but it says the others. So everything had been polluted, just like we're polluting things now. Mm -hmm. it was so bad that it had to start all over with those things, too. Yep. God took drastic measures to turn the world around, you might say. He did. But how long did it last? But, you know, with Noah, God, after they came out of the ark, no, God gave them a promise that he would never destroy the whole earth with a flood. Mm -hmm. There would never be a worldwide flood again. And we can find that um, in Genesis 9. Um, God bless Noah and his son saying, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, that's not the one I'm looking for. I, and God I said, the sign, this is a sign of the covenant making between you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Mm -hmm. Whenever you, I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. And God has definitely kept that. I mean, here we are this many thousand years later, mm -hmm. and the earth has never been destroyed by a flood again. And isn't it wonderful after it rains or during the rain, you see this beautiful rainbow. I love to see rainbows. There's an... Um, a uh, thing written in Patriarchs and Prophets about this, the promise of the rainbow. The Lord declares that when he looks upon the bow, he will remember his covenant. It was God's purpose that as the children of after generations should ask the meaning of the glorious arch which spans the heavens, their parents should repeat the story of the flood and tell them that the Most High had bended the bow and placed it in the clouds as an assurance that the water should never again overflow the earth. Mm-hmm. And I think that's an easy one to tell to your children. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. And yet how many story. people today miss even that? The big, huge sign in the sky 
It's got God's love written all over it. And even that has been perverted in today's society. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's everything that God has done, Satan has tried to counterfeit. Um, but God always fulfills his promise. And I see the long sufferingness of God that he said, yes. you know, even though it, it was the hardest thing I'm sure he ever did to, to think about starting over, yet he did it for the good of his children. And after it was all said and done, even he himself said, I, I can't go through that again. No matter what they, my children do, I won't do that again. And his long suffering toward the human race is just phenomenal. Well, then we would serve him out of fear if we were afraid mm -hmm. that there would be, every time you'd see a flood in your area, you'd think, is that going to be the whole earth again? Right. So it takes away some of our fear mm -hmm. and builds trust in God, I think, too. Yes. Um, anything else we have to share about Noah, or shall we move on to another covenant? Well, I think we need to turn to Second Peter and look at um, chapter 3, verse 5 to 9. Yes. But they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of the water and by water. By these waters also, the world at that time were deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, the first thing in that verse that you read just jumped out at me. People were, are willingly ignorant. There is no excuse for ignorance unless someone is willing, wants to shut their mind off to the promises of God. There is ample evidence of God's work within our own lives, of his promises that he's kept in the Bible. And the only reason that there is for the doubt and for the um, in unbelief that there is, is a willing, an unwillingness to actually choose to accept that. And if you've heard people say, don't tell me those things right. because then I won't know them and I'm yep. not responsible for them. And you, you do it, they do it jokingly, but sometimes it's really meant seriously. Mm -hmm. It is. And it is true that we're only accountable for the things that we know. But when we have opportunity to know and we willingly choose not to, I think we're all accountable yes. for that too. Yep. Very good. So we see the Lord's covenant with Noah was that of salvation, wasn't it? It was, a, it was a plan of salvation that was paralleling the plan of salvation for the human race. Sin entered, sin caused a problem, and sin caused separation in that relationship with God. And so God came up with a plan to be able to save people from that, and it required something on their part. It re required faith and obedience, and those two things go hand in hand because if we just obey without really believing what we're doing, we're just doing the work side of it, and our heart is not in it. And if we believe that what God says is going to happen, then we are going to follow through through obedience. Noah could have preached for 120 years that there was going to be a flood, but unless he got himself on that ark, no one would say he actually believed his own message. So I think those are some important lessons that we can learn from God's covenant with Noah. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to um, go back to Genesis again and look in chapter 12. Here we're seeing another covenant that God made now with another great man of God. And again, when you look back at these people who were great warriors for the truth or people that God talked with closely as a friend with a friend, there was nothing that set them aside as special other than the fact that they loved God with all their hearts that they had faith to believe that what God said would happen and that they obeyed what God commanded them to do. And what that tells me and encourages me is that we can do the exact same thing. We can have that close relationship with God, and that's what God wants from each and every one of us. So let's look at um, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Uh, Terry, are you there in your Bible? Yes. 
If you'd read those for us. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses you. And in thee all families of the earth will be blessed. Isn't that interesting? He would curse people that cursed him. Mm -hmm. I see in this, again, a big promise. It's, I'm going to bless the entire rest of humanity through you. I mean, that's a pretty big promise. Especially for Abraham at that, to Abram at that time having no children, no offspring. So it's a promise that he is going to have um, offspring, but it also came with, the, it started with a command for him to do something, right? He had to leave his father's home. So, I mean, you know, if you've lived in an area a long time and all your family's around, it is hard to think about mm -hmm. picking up and moving. But Abraham, Abram trusted God, and so he moved forward. With his, I mean, he had a lot of baggage, you might say, because he had, he had servants, he had tents, and I can't begin to imagine how... <laughs> well, even his wife was from his father's household, because I was basically a sister, mm -hmm. and so... I yeah, mean, he married his aunt. <laughs> and we, of course, we don't have any biblical insight into this, but just knowing how it is with humanity, I can imagine there was a whole lot of discussion going on in that household of, you know, do you really have to go, or why can't you just do what God, why can't he make a great nation right here? What's wrong with our household? And that, yet there was a reason why God asked him to leave his father's house. And for one thing, it showed Abraham, Abram's dependence upon God, because he mm -hmm. left. Can you imagine making a move without even knowing where you're going? That right. would take a lot of faith. And so along with the promise, again, comes the faith that needs to be exercised and the obedience that follows. So how does Abram respond to God's invitation to enter into this covenant relationship? Let's look in that same chapter, Genesis chapter 12, verse 4 says, So Abram departed. Just as simple as that, right? <laughs> <laughs> as, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. So he's not some spring chicken. I mean, he could have been doing a little debating, in my opinion, with God at this point, that, you know, you're making me this promise. Do you want to show me any kind of proof of this? Because not only am I not having any kids, but I'm getting a lot older by now, and now I'm having to move. This is a pretty big deal. But we don't see any of that. We see that Abram just got up, and he did what God instructed him to do, and he left, and he began heading in the direction that God showed him. I wonder how long it took him to pack. <laughs> I know. Right? I was thinking about Jeannie and Vern, you know, uh, sold their home and moved to Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And they're up in that age group. Of course, um, Abraham lived to 150 years, so he was maybe more in the prime of life. But <laughs> it certainly is a big undertaking. Oh, definitely. Yes. Moving is a big thing. And we kind of think, well, that's because of all the stuff we have nowadays. Back then, I would think it'd be a lot harder. You didn't have a moving truck to pack it into. It was all the animals because they had herds and yes. uh, camels, sheep, cattle. Yep. It would have been a lot of work. <laughs> but they so. did have servants. They did. <laughs> <laughs> and all the servants had all their stuff to move to. <laughs> and their families, yeah. Yes. So we see that Abram responded um, in submission, complete trust, and obedience then to God's will. And how then were all the families of the earth blessed through Abram? If we move to the New Testament, we get the answer to that, which I think is so, it's so neat that um, we have the ability to see both the old and the new. Because, I mean, all these people that we're talking about so far with Noah and Abram, these Old Testament people, they didn't have the privilege that we do of having all the previous stories and having everything written out. And then in addition to that, having after Jesus came, the new light with the disciples on what those stories actually meant. So we are very, very privileged in the time that we're living in now. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 3, and verses 6 through 9 says, Even as Abraham, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now I want to stop right there for a second, because isn't that what we want, is to be considered righteous in the eyes of God? That's how we... We think, you know, if we want to have eternal life, we need to be righteous, right? Even though we can't be righteous on our own. So what was it that, could, that Abraham 
was counted to him for righteousness. It was his belief in God. It's something so simple, childlike trust, simple faith, and yet something so complex that we struggle with it on a daily basis when we're faced with the simplest temptation. Am I going to surrender my will to the will of God? Or am I going to try to fight this on my own? So Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Know you, therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. And so then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So we see how Abraham's blessing that was going to come through all generations was none other than that of him trusting in God, the very same God that we have the privilege of trusting. And when we believe in God as Abraham did, we receive the same blessing that Abraham had. I think that's really cool. It's also listed in Hebrews um, 11, in the faith chapter, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to Genesis again, we're skipping back to where we just were in the story. Did God's promise, was it fulfilled immediately to Abraham? As soon as he moved and got settled, bam, right away? No, babies didn't <laughs> pop out at his house. <laughs> <laughs> so we see now, if we, if we skip to Genesis chapter 17, Abraham is, Abraham is now, or Abram still at this time, is now 99 years old. How old was he when he moved? 75. Yeah, so I mean some That's years have time. passed. 24 years have gone by. That's a long time. And now we see that God is coming to Abram again, and he's going to restate the exact same covenant that he stated to him 24 years before when he asked him to move, and nothing in it had changed. He didn't say, you know, sorry, I haven't gotten around to it yet. Just don't worry, it's going to happen pretty soon now, or any of that. But in the meantime, had Abram been completely faithful and trusting God, or had he decided to help things along a little? <laughs> it looks like about 13 years before. He, he and Sarah decided to take things into their own hands and help God out because mm -hmm. he was a little slow. Right. And, and I guess that was, uh, when you look back, that that was something they did in that time. Mm -hmm. wasn't what God wanted, but um, right. it would be a legal way to have children and, and call them yours. And we do see that in other, like Hannah, and, and she gave him this for Samuel. You right. know, she gave her, her husband, too. She's like, well, you know, I, but I want my own children. So that was kind of another thing similar to that. But... Um, what I find interesting this is that now we have another child in the family that was not through the will of God, wasn't God's original plan. But instead of God coming to Abram and saying, well, you know what? Sorry, buddy. Lost your chance. So I'm going to move on to another person here. He actually comes and says in chapter 17, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. So he came and said the same thing to him, basically. I am going to fulfill this promise through you. Do you think that that really was a humbling experience for Abram? To realize that even though he had tried to go and help God out, probably in the, in the goodness of his own heart, that God didn't re reject him because of that? but he was willing to move forward, and so he started at that point um, the new covenant with circumcision, and I believe that can be symbolic too, to say, yes, a mistake was made, but here, we're gonna make it right, and we're still gonna do things God's way. So now do this, follow in with God's plan, and I am going to still fulfill my covenant with you and multiply you exceedingly upon the earth. It says that, um he and his children and all the men in his family center were circumcised on one day. I mean, that had been harsh, and it had to really bring um, to the forefront to remember to put God first and to talk to him before you rush into things. Mm -hmm. And so we see that even though sometimes God, has a, God always has a plan for our lives, sometimes we may take detours with that. Do you think God has a way of bringing us back around? Sure does, yes. I believe so. I think if we do it honestly, I mean, well, any way you look at it, he, he's there to help us. He has a handout looking for us. 
to bring and us back. And it all goes back to the fact that these rules are established, the covenant, covenants he is establishing with us are for the good of his own children. Yes. It's not, it's not a dogmatic relationship. It's not, you know, a thing where he's trying to force people to do anything or have servitude. It's because he knows that it comes from, well, God is the ultimate um, being of love, and he's the epitome of selflessness, and that is what he is trying to instill in each of us because as the more selfless we become, the more fulfilled we are actually in happiness and in relationships with other people. We're told that if we could see the end from the beginning, we would agree with whatever God leads us through. That's right. Very good. And I think when we, we look at this as a relationship thing again, um, the relationship that God is wanting to have with each of his children, it is one of love and um, just wanting the best for everyone for sure. This is almost like Noah because he's creating a nation from Abraham. Mm -hmm. Noah started a whole, uh, well, all the people on earth again. Yep. And Abraham is... Uh, bringing Israel, the start of Israel. So it's interesting how he, he goes in sections like this. And, and I think a, a wonderful word picture of how God was going to bless Abraham's family. He took him out to look at the stars in the sky. Can you number the stars? Can you count the sand of the sea? And God is promising him that he will, it will be a blessing and that Jesus will come from the line of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And so he, he was a pillar of the people. Absolutely. And I believe that Jesus um, was also, in part of this covenant, was Abraham was starting this, um, the family of God. But Jesus came partway through to finish that work. So Abraham was promised that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his seed. And we know that Christ came through that line as well. When Jesus came, I believe he fulfilled the other part of that promise. That now everyone who believes in ultimately in God mm -hmm. through Jesus' blood is made one family. Mm -hmm. And in that we're all receiving the promise given to Abraham that Abraham started through the promise of God. So there is now, as Galatians, if we look in Galatians uh, chapter 3 verse 28 there is now no Jew or Greek so we don't have this race thing there's no bond or free there's no male or female but all are one in Christ Jesus so I think we can see here that just as everyone is um, made in through Abraham's line everyone who believed in that promise was part of Abraham's family so then when Jesus died and his blood now everyone who believes in Christ is all one big family of God, too. I think that's really neat. It shows with Ruth and Boaz, where she was mm -hmm. brought into the same line that Jesus was going yep. to come through. She was technically not from Abraham's exactly. lineage. Right. It was interesting to me that um, Abraham was so concerned about his son, Ishmael, and wanted God to bless him, and he wanted to, him to live, even though he was going to have a son, God said. And God said he would bless him, even though it wasn't his fault that the parents had made a mistake, mm -hmm. and he did make him a great nation. He did, yes. Mm -hmm. Again, God is working with the mistakes of humanity mm -hmm. to make them work out. Do you, uh, Terry, would you like to take us into the next covenant with Moses here? God's promise to Moses, is, uh, look at Exodus 6, um, 7. And it says that I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God, and he shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So God made a promise uh, to Moses and to his people that he would help them and bring them out. It also going to um, Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, so here he's talking about a covenant again, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So he's talking to Moses here. And uh, that had to be very hard. Moses was started out in the Pharaoh's household. He learned all the ways of war and, um, and all their bad things too. About they had many gods, but um, God made this covenant with him when he had to leave and uh, go out and herd sheep for 40 years. He was cl brought closer to God and to God's ways. Mm -hmm. It says he communed with God face to face. And th there was the burning bush. And um, in Exodus 20, one through three, uh, the response was from Moses. God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and then it goes on into um, the Ten Commandments, which God gave to Israel after they had come out. And it wasn't just for rules. It was to teach them how to love mm -hmm. God, how to love each other. They'd been slaves, and they weren't slaves all the time, but 400 years from Abraham down to Moses is a long time. For everyone that was there, their entire lifetime. <laughs> yeah, and so that Servitude. was many generations mm -hmm. that they had learned to even if they started out not worshiping idols, uh, they were around it constantly. So they needed to be taught how to love one God and to depend on him for all the things that they had. Yeah, definitely. So, and I see in this, again, God's prefacing these, what we call the Ten Commandments, the Ten Rules or whatever. He's prefacing that with, I am the one who brought you, I bore you on eagle's wings. I mean, what a picture of love that Isn't God that a, had. And not only did I bring you out to, a, to inherit a land, I brought you to myself. That's what God was wanting. Yes. He was wanting to bring his people out of servitude and out of slavery to himself because he wanted to have that close relationship with them again. He wanted them to be his special treasure, like his prize, his, his joy. You know, I think as a parent with children, we don't, just make our children do what we want them to do just to glorify ourselves we want to have we want them to love us in return we want them to be um, to trust us and to have that relationship with us and, and at this stage when the people heard the commandments being given they were terrified mm -hmm. they didn't even want they said all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and when they saw it they removed and stood afar off and they said to Moses, uh, speak to us, but, and we will hear, but don't let God speak with us lest we die. They were out, but he needed something to get their attention mm -hmm. completely, but it was really hard for them to start with. Yes, and I think that in God speaking to them, he was trying to remind them that, think about what I have just done for you. And again, we, we go, we look at it and say, how in the world could they start murmuring and turn their back on God just maybe days or weeks after he opened the Red Sea for them and let them walk through on dry ground? You know, how could they be so dense? And yet I think about ourselves, not only do we have their history and we have the whole story of redemption written out and we have all of the other early Christians and all the privilege that we know and look how easily we fall back into the same pining, temptations and doubts that we struggle with on a daily basis so we can't be too quick to to jump after <laughs> how <laughs> how they were um, but I see through these through all of these covenants over and over again the message of love that God was trying to share with his people was one that he's looking for the love relationship to be returned and he wouldn't have brought them out if he didn't love them um, because they could have stayed there in bondage and, yeah. and died there was no it, it wasn't a blessing to God necessarily. Right. It was to help bring them closer to him mm -hmm. and to a family relationship, it seems like. Yeah. So I think it's, um, if we look at that question there, um, C, do you want to read that question for us in number four? Is obedience to the Lord's commands the way to be saved or a response to the salvation that has already been provided? Well, I think it's both, really, and um, it has already been provided. Uh, they were looking from Abraham and Moses' times, they were looking forward to those times. Now we have it given to us already, 
And um, so now it would be just obedience to God's law with his help um, and accepting uh, the salvation that he has provided. It's there free for everyone if you'll just accept that gift. Yes, and I think that it's been, it's the same as what we've been talking about all along, that the rules are there, and we will obey them as we trust God by faith. We don't obey them to prove our loyalty to God. We obey them because of the love that we have for God. But a reaction it, exactly. of, of your love for him coming out. And it's to help us be, um, protect us from falling, mm -hmm. showing our love. Definitely. Um, I, I forgot to ask what time we're supposed to close. Ten, I mean. In five minutes? <laughs> Oh, five till. Okay. And that clock is correct. Okay. I'm sorry. A little detour there. I just realized I don't even know what time. So I think maybe for the last couple of minutes, should we skip um, to the new covenant? Let's touch on that briefly. I know there's just so much more we could delve into with all of these, but I want to look very quickly at the new covenant now that Jeremiah talks about. Um, in fact, let's turn there. Um, Rosemary, if you're turning there, maybe you could read for us Jeremiah 31. And it's verses 31 to 34. So Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. The, Lord, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel <clears throat> and with the house of Judah. I will not be like the covenant. It will, it will not be like the covenant I made with your forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Because they broke the, my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant, declares the Lord, I will make with the house of Israel at the time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. I, I think, again, when I think about the heart of God in these verses, I think all through history, from the time God created man, he wanted to have a tight, close relationship with people. And he did everything he could to show them this. He wrote laws to help them remember. He said, tell this to your children so that they don't forget what I have done for you. I am the God that did all these amazing things for you. And time after time after time, they turned their back on him. They broke that covenant. And finally, God said, you know what? I am going to go to the next step because somehow when I write it down, all humans just want is to do something. And I think we fall into this even today. And we see this with people in Jesus' day. What do I need to do in order to have eternal life. Just tell me what to do. The Israelites said, just whatever you say, we'll do. Does God want us to stop doing and just start being? He wants us to be connected with him. He wants us to have an emotional bond with him. Can you imagine in a marriage if the husband set the ground rules but really wanted to have a loving, or husband and wife created their, their contract and said, this is what we expect from each other, and all they did was just do it? I didn't do anything wrong. What more do you expect from me? It isn't just about not doing something wrong. It's about being in love with someone. You know, it's like you can write every possible rule in the book, but if someone doesn't have your, if you don't have their heart, what good does it do? Yeah. And I think what I hear God saying here is, I've given you everything I can give you, and you still don't have your heart. So now I'm going to have a new covenant. It's not that it's so different that he, he realized that all those things weren't important. He says, now I'm going to write it right in your heart so you can't forget. And even with that, it's in our heart like it is now. But do we still ever just look at the Bible and say, oh, what else do I have to do to be good? Can we stop looking at what we need to do and start being who God wants us to be? I think that's what I see in this new covenant is God is saying, stop trying to do it in your own strength. Start relying on me and trusting me to do it through you. Accept the sacrifice that's been made for you. Accept the salvation that's already been given to you. And just 
be my friend. Well, well Paul, when Saul became Paul, he said, according to the law, I'm, I'm the champion. I've done everything <laughs> to the letter, the very yeah. letter of the law. But he had to be converted. Absolutely. And it was really hard to get his attention. Yep. God came to because him in a very special way. He felt so self-righteous. Yes. Yes. So we can do everything right, but without that relationship with God, it's worth nothing. And so that's what I see in this new covenant yes. is that God takes it to the next level of the personal relationship with us where he says, I'm going to put it in your heart so that it can be a heart response and not just a matter of doing. It says in um, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 372, the same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, we accept the righteousness of Christ. His blood atones for our sins. His obedience is accepted for us. Then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, which would be obeying the commandments and things like that. Through the grace of Christ, we shall live in obedience to the law of God written upon our hearts. So we can't do anything of ourselves, it seems like. The Holy Spirit, Jesus has to impress us for every good thing. Mm -hmm. isn't Definitely, and I like that, that you brought in the Holy Spirit there, which I think is a very under-talked about subject. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, I would say, gave us another covenant. He said, I'm going, but I'm going to send you. It's a comforter. promise. Yes. I am going to send you another comforter, another one of me, who is going to be with you everywhere in all places to, to bring these things to your remembrance and to lead you into all truth. Because Jesus couldn't do it all while he was here. And so a lot of times we look and we say, we need to tell, or we tell our kids, we need to be like Jesus. We need to be like Jesus. And I think what we need to start doing is saying, Lord, please be in me. Send me the Holy Spirit to dwell in me. Be in my heart. And that will help us to not try to just do, but to be yes. uh, living in the covenant. There's a lot more we could discuss, but I think we're running out of time. <laughs> so um, let us close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the love that you have given to us since the beginning of time. Thank you for showing us in every possible way um, how you want us to live, how you want to be dwelling in us. And Lord, in our frail humanity, we just we grasp at ideas and we latch onto things that we can do in our own strength because it's concrete in our minds and we're, we have the instincts within us to just do what we can. We think of like Martin Luther trying to work his way to heaven, and that's not the right way. We know that all obedience comes as a result of faith in your, in your promises, and we just pray that as we learn to, to grab hold of that and to trust you by faith, that you would fill us with your spirit so that we would be able to live righteous lives in accordance with your will so that the promises that you have given to us and the covenants that you have made with your people can be fulfilled to the utmost. Father, maybe we'd be found faithful when your eyes search to and fro in the earth to see if there is anyone that you can trust. May your eyes rest upon the Linwood Church and the people here and say, these people, these people trust me enough that I can work through them mighty miracles, that I can lead them in their lives, that they can bring others to you as well, Father. Ultimately, that's our goal. We want to be um, vessels used to your glory. And I pray, Lord, as we continue to look at the covenants that you have made with us, that it would bind our hearts to yours with bonds that cannot be broken. Bless each one of us today and guide us in your way. We thank you so much. In your name, amen. Amen.